Hello, Mine University students. It is now time to decide the top five Marvel Cinematic Universe films of all time because your Geek History lesson is now in session. And welcome to Geek History Lesson. I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. And I'm Jason Marvelous Inman. But you already know that because this is Geek History Lesson, the podcast where we take one character, construct, or idea and package it up in a nice little podcast in less than an hour. But today, we're not doing any of that. Today... We're doing a list. That's right. And to celebrate the much anticipated release of Avengers Endgame. Well, it's already out in the world. Yeah. It's already out in the world now. We're celebrating the fact that it is out in the world. But we are saying (laughs) that because as at the time of this recording, nobody on this podcast has seen Avengers Endgame. That's true. So there will be no Avengers Endgame spoilers. There will be no Avengers Endgame influences of any kind. And, uh, you know, we can't even tell you if the Silver Surfer showed up. We have no idea. He could have. Do you think he showed up? No. All right. You're probably right. <laughs> uh, but luckily, we have a great guest join us today. And this guest is, I'm going to call him a Marvel expert. I think he's straight up a Marvel expert. But he's also the host of the Coverville podcast and the co-host of the Morning Stream. Please welcome to Geek Hush Lesson, Brian Ibbett. Thank you, guys. Uh, great, uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Also, a uh, red shirt diary alumni. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Oh my God. How many takes did it uh, did we take on that? Uh... <laughs> Romulan commander, not that many. My angry, angry, angry Romulan commander. Oh no, I guess it was more the uh, it was the Arlie Ermy. It was the that's yeah, what yeah. I was channeling for that one. <laughs> it was like the calmest Romulan in all of history. I was. I think so. Maybe. Uh, yeah. I think uh, I think Scott took more. Take Scott Johnson, uh, Brian's co-host, reading the final letter. So don't feel bad. Yep. Okay, good, good. All right, good. <laughs> I didn't know they stacked Romulan ale that high. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Brian, before we get into our list, I want to ask you, and just so anybody or our listeners don't doubt you, what are some of your bona fides when it comes to the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Have you read a lot of Marvel comic books? I, I assume you've seen all the movies. But, uh, do tell. I've I've definitely seen all the movies. I've even watched. Okay, I hope, every, hope everyone's sitting down. I've even watched the entirety of the Inhumans television series. Oh dear, thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, thank Somebody you for your service. It, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so no, I've been a uh, comic book reader since. I mean, as long as as, as far back as I can remember. Um, my uncle was a big Marvel guy, Marvel comics guy, and so he bought everything. Um, and then I had the, the, the benefit of getting to read everything he bought. I mean, this is before, obviously before apps and before all this stuff was available digitally, um, go into the comic store, getting them off that, that rotating metal wire rack, uh, the six comics high Marvel or a, a comic rack. And, uh, um, and then getting to bring those home and, and getting to read them. And he was great. He would like say, okay, here's this story arc. And then what you need to do is read this issue. And then this issue from these other stories, like he's, he's Marvel completist. So again, I get the benefit of all of that. He would say, all right, you want the, you want the contest of champions. Okay. You're going to start here and then you're going to read these issues, but then you're going to go over to this series and read this issue. Cause it has a tie in and this character appears here. Um, so from as far back as I can remember, I've had the, uh, the pleasure of being a Marvel Marvel Comics fan. Brian, do you know how lucky you are that you had a spirit guide through your early comics journey? Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I totally realize that because, uh, you know, these days the Marvel, um, what is it called? Ult- not Ultimate, the uh, whatever the app is. Unlimited. Unlimited. Yeah, Marvel Unlimited does a pretty good job of saying, all right, you've got this is all part of this story arc, but it doesn't always put everything in the right order. You've got to find one of those first issues where they actually have the graphic that maps out. Mm-hmm. Like, all right, if you want to read, uh, uh, you know, Dark Phoenix Rising, then you start with these issues and then go into these issues. And um, But uh, no, I had a spirit guide, definitely. That's, a, that's amazing that <laughs> your uncle was a Marvel zombie, as I've heard them called. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, really absolutely cool. was. And he'd keep track. We have um, out here, we have a, um, a chain of comic book shops called, naturally, Mile High Comics here in Colorado. And he'd keep up with who was coming to each of the each of the stores, which comic creators are coming to the stores, and then let me know which comics I needed to uh, bring for my own collection to have signed. And so I've actually gotten to meet folks like Claremont and Stan Lee and um, – 
Bob Layton, Mike Golden, uh, man, it, like, so many great creators and writers and artists and, and George Perez, and then basically getting to take them, take comics to them and get them signed. And this was before you had the authentication. So I've got so many comics in my library that are signed, but there's no like proof that, all right, yeah, that really is, you know, George Perez's signature on that, that uh, issue of Teen Titans or Avengers or, or whatever. But, I do, uh, th- I do think now for some of those past comic books, I think they take pictures as authentication. Do you have pictures of any of these luminaries? Uh, no, <laughs> no, because back then that would have me- meant uh, taking a whole camera yep. and then taking film out to a photo mat and having it. Yep. <laughs> I know how, what a lo- glorious lazy age we live in. I know it totally is like, you can have everything now. I want it now. Oh, that's so but, cool. Uh, I, it's funny. If, if, if anyone out there doesn't know what mile high comics is, I have never been to one, but I know about it because in the nineties they used to always have a full page ad in every yes. DC and Marvel comic book. And <laughs> I actually ordered comics from mile high comics because they would list out, they were like, we have these issues and they're worth, and they are this cost, they cost this much. And they would give you a little corner that you had to cut out as the order form. So mm-hmm. if I saw an issue where I was like, oh, man, I really I, I want to buy that comic, but I want I don't want to ruin my comic. I would either go back to the local Walmart where I bought my comic books and buy a duplicate a issue. <laughs> yeah, just to cut it out. Or I would buy what I call a bunk issue where a comic book issue where I was like, I don't care about that comic book, but it's a dollar. Okay, oh, I'll buy gotcha. It. Right. So right, I can right. have the order form. But so I've ordered from Mile High to like complete my collection, but I've never actually been there. <laughs> yeah, back when it's, it was okay to cut stuff out of comic yeah. books. <laughs> right. Oh man, and and uh, is it ever? But <laughs> no, that's actually my my horror story is um, well, not really a horror story, but uh, a copy that's sitting behind me on the shelf of Hulk number one hundred and eighty one, first appearance of uh, Wolverine, mm-hmm. and it's in it's in great condition. I mean, it is in really really nice condition. Um, it's in a you know acid free bag inside a plastic case and with a backing board, etc. Um, but the Marvel value stamp <laughs> has been cut out of it. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> Which, I remember again, those back in the seventies. Yeah, I mean, it was like basically. I don't even know what you used these for. It was basically like a. It, it looked like a stamp. Had the stamp edges, and each one would be a superhero. And you'd cut them out, and you'd put them on a on a sheet, tape them down, or whatever. And I don't know what you'd do with them. It's not like you could send them in for a free Boba Fett action figure or something like, you know, like the old Star Wars figures. But uh, for whatever reason, the person who um, who sold this one to the comic store where I bought it for a song. Like I got it for, I don't know, probably under a hundred dollars, probably 50 bucks or something. The cool thing about it is that it's a non artwork page. So the, the front side of that page is the, uh, the bullpen bulletins thing, which is typically where those things appeared. And the back page or back of that is probably like a hostess fruit pie ad or something like that. Again, which were in every single Marvel comic back in the seventies. Fun um, fact, so, they, they actually brought those stamps back a couple of years ago. Did they really? They okay. did, to which uh, I think the general audience reaction was, what are stamps? Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Things you put on envelopes. Okay. What yeah. are envelopes? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's let's drop into our list uh, just real quick, uh, listeners out there. Our rules were basically it had to be a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, uh, so no X Men movies, no Howard the Duck, none of that, and it had to basically be any movie before Endgame. So Captain Marvel does count, but Endgame does not, and basically there were no other rules. So before, real quick, we get to our list, I would be remiss, my friends, if I did not tell you about my new book. Super Soldiers, which talks about many of the characters that are going to be in some of these movies that we're going to talk about. Captain America, War Machine. I have a chapter on Captain Marvel and more. Uh, I'm very proud of this book. It hits stores June 15th and explores how comic book superheroes have been influenced by the true heroes of our armed forces for decades. But don't take my awesome word for it. Uh, Dan Jurgen, Jurgen, excuse me, the writer artist of Superman and Captain America and the creator of Booster Gold, he read it and he had this to say about it. He said, Super Soldiers is an in depth examination of a fascinating topic, which is a remarkable study of our country's heroes, both real and imagined. And it shows their compelling links through the ever changing course of our nation's military history. So if you trust my word and if you trust the word of Dan Jurgens, a person who has worked on Captain America, then please pre order my new book, Super Soldiers, at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere else you can buy books right now. All right, enough of this self promotion. Let's get into the top five 
five Marvel Cinematic Movies. Ashley. Yes. Would you please start off the list with your number five? My number five, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised, is at number five because it's a pretty impactful movie. It's a movie that is pretty uh, liked and respected across the board. But I didn't feel confident putting it higher than number five because you have to watch about 20 movies for it to make any sense or have any impact. And that is, of course, Avengers Infinity War. Uh, Avengers Infinity War is the beginning of the culmination of everything that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is driving toward. And it does that in a really powerful, really interesting story that both follows a typical superhero adventure plotting style and also deviates from that entirely and kind of does whatever it wants because, let's be honest, there's no real conclusion to it. There is an ending to the movie that is satisfying narratively from where we've spent the two and a half hours coming from up to this point. But the door is so open that if you want to really understand what the full impact of Thanos is going to be on this universe, you're going to have to watch Endgame. It's also, it's not the first time we've seen all of these characters together, but it's the first time we've seen this many characters together. It's the first time we've seen them fighting at this level. And it's the first time we've seen a lot of these particular pairings, which I think is why the teams were broken up the way they were and why I think we've had these factions breaking off the way they were. For example, it's the first time we see the Guardians of the Galaxy interacting with anyone who's based on Earth, things like that. Um, and it's why they largely wind up, I think, on Tony's side of this conflict that was laid down in Civil War. I also really respect Endgame for daring to do a lot of the things that it does. This movie is such a huge swing, and it, I mean, really, just to be kind of crummy about it, it could have been such a huge fail failure. And the fact that it's a comprehensible movie where we understand the motivations of every character on screen. Even if you want to say, well, Thanos is the most powerful being in the world by the time he's assembled this gauntlet, he really doesn't have to kill everyone. It's, he's not making a very creative choice here, but I admire the fact that he sticks to that choice and he is unwavering throughout the movie. That's what makes him such a great villain to this movie. So I really wanted to feature this, but I didn't feel a good conscious I could put it above number five because if you've never seen any of the other movies, who are these people? <laughs> what are they doing? Who is that California raisin they're fighting? You know, it's a little tough to parse if you're not familiar with uh, the lore, at least post Avengers 1. I'm going to hop in on this, Ashley, because my number five is also Avengers Infinity War. Heck yeah. Uh, at the exact same number. And I, I agree with you. And the reason why I put it at number five is because it is half of a movie. Like we like a lot of this will change once we see Endgame. But it's funny. We actually recently rewatched this movie mm -hmm. and I was surprised at how well it just sucked me in and kept me entertained. And I for the two and a half hours, because it's a long movie. It is a long movie. My, I didn't get bored. Mm -hmm. and, and you are correct. This does an amazing job of juggling 25 major characters and the movie you know, just structurally and dramatically, it does work. And I, I give it a lot of kudos because this is one of the only movies that I know of where the bad guy wins. Mm -hmm. the, the, the heroes mm -hmm. lose in this movie. They lose hard in this mm -hmm. movie. Well, about half of them uh, blip away. <laughs> yes. And also the fact of the matter is, is that we know that a lot of these characters that become dust in the wind, they're coming <laughs> back because they're getting sequels. But... Their impact or their fake deaths mm -hmm. really work. Like, Spider-Man oh, almost yeah. brings you to tears every single time. Yeah, because Tom Holland gives a really fabulous performance. And he's one of the characters that you definitely know is coming back because they announced the date of his sequel. Yes. Well, well, and, <laughs> right. and we've even seen trailers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I guarantee you we're going to see trailers for it when we see Avengers Endgame. When, uh, <laughs> when Jason and I saw um, Infinity War for the first time, there was a little boy in a Spider-Man hoodie who was sobbing Aww. after this movie. And I so badly wanted to be a weird stranger and run up to him and be like, it's okay. <laughs> they announced the next movie. He's going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> but I think for me, I had to put Infinity War on my list of top five because you you, you nailed it. It is it is the culmination of everything they've been building to. And I got to say, 
it was a great build. Like I, this, I, this was a great payoff to this universe. I've heard you describe um, its audacity as well, and the fact that it dares to do what it does because mm-hmm. um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty hard turn. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is sometimes criticized for the the Disney sheen that it has on it, for how clean it is, and for playing it safe. And this really bucks against what I think of as being uh, an MCU movie in a lot of ways. Cool. All right, Brian. Mm-hmm. Since we yes. already changed the scales, what is your number five? <laughs> well, we might be talking about that one in a little bit, but oh. uh, my number five is, I mean, we're, we might be talking about uh, Infinity War again in a little bit. I'll save that. <laughs> but uh, my number five is Black Panther. Uh, love this film. And uh, I knew it had to be up in my top five because of how impactful it was. This is a character that, again, growing up reading Marvel comics, I'd get the occasional Black Panther story as part of larger story arcs, um, uh, Civil War, uh, um, older issues, uh, Avengers, you know, of course, he, uh, he was a member of the Avengers back in the day, back in the 70s and 80s. And so you'd get those crossover things where you'd have to go and read a, uh, an issue of Black Panther to get the backstory of Claw, who I'm so excited to see as a uh, as a villain in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I can't wait until he's actually got the whole Claw uh, appearance, hopefully at some point. Well, I guess I guess maybe you can't, can he? <laughs> uh, That's what I was gonna say. I was like, yeah, I don't know if that's happening, man. They, yeah, I mean, unless <laughs> there's some uh, some resurrection situation. All right, well, maybe we won't get clones in his uh, in his Jack Kirby esque uh, uh, style. But anyway, still. Um, was such a big fan of this movie. Saw this in Boston with uh, a bunch of friends out there. I was out there for a, a trivia competition, and it was an audience full of Marvel fans, like cheering when when uh, Black Panther was on screen. Maybe not necessarily booing and hissing when Killmonger was up there, but still a lot of excitement and energy in the whole theater. And that's that does a lot for me too to um, uh, to add to the excitement and good feeling of a film is how how good the experience was seeing it if i go see it in a in a crummy theater with a small screen and a bunch of people who don't care uh you know it might affect my enjoyment of the film but this one was this one was great and seeing actors like uh angela bassett forrest whitaker like acclaimed actors in a marvel comic book film is just mind-blowing nice all right ashley what is your number four my number four was uh, very conveniently just introduced by our guest, Brian Ibbett. <laughs> it is Black Panther. Um, I think it's really tough to not put Black Panther on this list simply for the cultural impact that this character has had. I'm going to reveal right now, uh, Black Panther is my number three. <laughs> so <laughs> It's a sliding scale for Black Panther. I love that. Yeah. Um I just think this movie, kind of like when you talk about Wonder Woman in the DCEU, what it means outside of its effectiveness as a movie is so huge. Um, And I know we're a bunch of white folk, but I think we can all understand that. And I think we all saw that. And even if it wasn't reflective of us to see what this meant to an entire community of people was completely amazing. And then step away from that and just come at it as a movie fan. It's a great movie. It's very close to what we're used to seeing in the classic origin stories um, of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. However, it is very steeped in its own mythology, and that's what makes it feel fun, and that's what makes it feel fresh. I think this is movie number 18 or 19 in the MCU, and it doesn't feel like we're doing Iron Man you know, 7.0. It is completely its own thing. I also think Black Panther... If you look at the ensemble cast and the composite parts, I think it has the strongest cast of mm-hmm. of maybe any single MCU movie. And what I love the most about it are, honestly, the supporting parts and the surprises in it. Uh, we did a lesson on Shuri that I taught, and I was pretty critical of the way that that character was treated uh, narratively and artistically. And what Letitia Wright did with this character and what Ryan Coogler did with her character, the writers, and who they've made Shuri into, this character, this version is going to be the one that goes forward. This is the character that children are cosplaying as. She's amazing, and it's because of the version that we saw in this movie. Um, M'Baku is the same thing. M'Baku, the white ape, 
a vaguely troubling idea, very reflective of the time it came out. But because Winston Duke is so amazing and because they let him go a little wild with this character, this is a character that people care about. This is a character we have action figures of. This is a character that we're going to see. We saw only appear in Infinity War because people liked him so much. And the fact that this movie was willing to let its characters evolve while also being reflective in a very sincere way of the cultures that it was drawing from, I think speaks to the amount of care and respect that goes into. And honestly, movies going forward, MCU movies and otherwise need to look at Black Panther um, basically to kind of see how the game is played, I think. So that's why, yeah, I definitely had to put Black Panther on my list. No, I think that's a great thought. I agree completely with that thought. I think I, I wouldn't even just say Marvel movies. I would say almost Every, I would say, origin superhero mm-hmm. movie should mm-hmm. take a deep look at Black Panther because there is, again, and, and this may be the reason why I've picked some of these movies and why Black Panther is my number three is because there's a lot of stuff in Black Panther that when you look at it on paper could not work. Like the idea of an af- Afro futuristic sci fi movie, like that on paper, you're like, okay, I, I think that can work, but I don't know, maybe in execution it doesn't. And they, the filmmakers, they, Completely. Ryan Coogler pulls this off completely. And the idea of this movie, I got to say as well, um, I forget his name, Michael B. Jordan. There it is. Uh, Killmonger is one of the best Marvel villains they've ever had. So, I actually think he actually takes a lot, of, a lot of inspo yeah. from uh, Thor's Loki. I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> well, well, Loki's one of the better villains as well. But that is a, a, a criticism that is levied at the Marvel Cinematic Universe a lot is that they don't have a lot of strong villains. It's a, it's the argument you've heard as comic fans for a long time is that DC has better villains, but Marvel almost has more uh, humanistic heroes. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why you go, you know, because like you can't really beat the Joker, but you know, but Killmonger as well. And you're right in the comics. Killmonger is an afterthought of a character. He's really problematic. He He's not even compelling at all. But Michael B. Jordan really imbues him with some depth. And his speech when he dies is amazing. It is like a yeah. mic drop of a moment. And it's so good, it makes me wish that they hadn't killed him off. I wish that he was in every Black Panther yeah, movie now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. comics. He could come back. That's true. That's <laughs> Let's true. be honest. Well, it's, it's the same as Brian's thought with Claw. Like, right, yeah, with this, Claw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, the snapping could bring anybody back. <laughs> uh, exactly, right. Yeah. But, you know, he's so good that I kind of wanted to see the elements of sort of a Darth Vader role. Like, I wanted to see Killmonger and Black Panther sort of become friends over a couple movies. Like, sort of a Hal Jordan Sinestro kind of role. Like, there, there's a lot of interesting ways you could have taken that character. But that also shows you that I'd never met that character before this movie. And when they killed him, I was like, oh, damn, I wish they hadn't killed him. He's awesome. So... Kudos, Black Panther. Also, we have to mention uh, first superhero movie to ever be nominated for uh, Best Picture Oscar. Oh, yes. very well said. Yeah. So yep, yep, yep. that's uh, that definitely uh, ensures that he's on this list. All right. So we found out my number three. We found out Ashley's number four. Brian, what is your number four? <laughs> My number four, well, we're going to go all over the place. My number four is uh, the sequel to Guardians of the Galaxy called Guardians of the Galaxy Surprise Volume 2. Now, um, I think there are aspects of the original, uh, the first movie that I like a lot better. However, the most fun moment for me in any Marvel Cinematic Universe is the first five minutes of Guardians of the Galaxy 2 and it's Baby Groot dancing to Mr. Blue Sky by Electric Light Orchestra while, while the rest of the team is battling the the big blob monster. It is, I had a smile on my face seeing in the theater for the first time, even watching it since then. I have the biggest grin on my face watching that whole scene. It's so well timed and uh, so well presented in a way that, you know, he's almost missed by this thing. And then uh, Zoe Saldana looks over and says, hey, watch out, you're going to get killed just as she gets kind of whisked away and and, and Groot's just fine. It is such a fun uh, moment of the film. And you kind of get that again later on in the film with um, uh, with Yondu and his era when he's taking out the rest of the Ravagers, the old Ravagers, and, uh, and you get uh, come a little bit closer during that scene. It's such 
I'm a, I'm such a music guy, and it's going to be no surprise to anybody that my favorite parts of a film are going to be uh, where they use music the best, and it's those two pieces of music and the way they they integrate those into the storyline that put this one above the first Guardians of the Galaxy for me. Uh, Palm, uh, boy, I'm not going to pronounce your last name right. Clementif, Clementif. I'm going to anyway. say yes. <laughs> yeah, Mantis. Let's say Mantis. Let's say Mantis. <laughs> uh, great character introduction. Can't wait to see more of her in future films. Um, she's also do. great in Infinity War. She is great in Infinity War, yeah, and she's a, a really compelling character. Um, you got uh, Nebula, kind of again straddling that crossover line into all right, villain, but maybe a little bit on the hero side as well. Uh, maybe not the strongest performance by Kurt Russell, but still kind of fun seeing him in there as ego. And, He's a good uh, villain. And he is a piece of pretty good villain. And then Nick, the introduction of the comic book. Guardians of the Galaxy with Sylvester Stallone yeah. and, and uh, the, the crystalline guy whose name is I'm blanking on. But um, it's just so cool to see all those all those bits of fan service. And yeah, you even get a Howard the Duck uh, second cameo in this one as well. Nice. Uh, I agree. With you. I will say this as well. Um, and I, I guess we should have said this very early. There, of course, there was going to be spoilers for all this movie. But also, I don't, <laughs> for, I don't know why you're listening to this list if you haven't seen these movies. Right, because it would right. make no sense to you. Um <laughs> Also, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, I'm going to call it right now, the best death in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, at the very end with old Michael Rooker. Oh. Oh, yeah. The think, most heartbreaking yeah. death. Wow. I think, yeah. it's, I think it's easily the best death. Now, again, we haven't seen Endgame, so we don't know. But as of right, right now, I think to me, every time I see that, I'm like, oh, man, that is just, and especially with the Cat Stevens song, like, Yes. Oh Lord! Like it, that is a little bit too much. Oh, well, you put Cat Stevens on anything, and I'm probably gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Oh yeah, so touching, and and uh, yeah, who knows? I mean, we don't know what's gonna happen with uh, the the Infinity Gauntlet and what how far back it can go. <laughs> there you go. All right, so my number four is a little movie. It's probably the you know it's not a big movie. It doesn't have a lot of characters in it. You know, a lot of you know only like twenty five and. I like to call this movie a different title than the actual official title. I like to call this movie Avengers Smackdown, <laughs> or as most people call it, Captain America Civil War. Mm. Uh, that is my number four. Now, the fact of Civil War is that for me, it is not as tightly plotted or paced as well as I think Winter Soldier or the first Avenger, but... You have to include it in this top five simply for the fact of the airport fight of yeah. seeing 12 superheroes run as fast as they can at each other and just wallop into each other. Like every time that scene happens. Do you think that's Tom Cruise's favorite superhero scene? Oh, that they're all running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're all yes. running. <laughs> of course it is. Of course it is. But they're all running at that moment, that climax. Like, well, that's, uh, I'll get to that point in, in a minute because this movie has two climaxes. Um, is that they're all running at each other as fast as possible and just seeing Captain America haul off on Iron Man. Also, we cannot forget that this is the first indu- introduction of Spider Man into our Marvel Cinematic Universe. And Spider Man is awesome in this movie he's really really good and i know that was an aspect before this movie came out everybody was worried about how will spider-man fit into this universe and seeing him as tony stark jr really works in this movie and seeing his reactions with captain america this movie also is the introduction of black panther and black panther is also really good in this movie as well so there were a lot of things in this movie again you're, you're going to see a common tread with me on my Marvel movies. My Marvel favorite Marvel movies are the ones that, from the outside, should never have worked. But they really, really do. Now, again, I'm going to knock this movie down a couple pegs, even though it is my number four. I do think the climax is not as strong as the airport fight. I do think the movie carries on a little bit too long. But when you look at this movie, especially through the lens of this is Captain America fighting as hard as he can for his best friend, Bucky, against the guy who I guess thought he was Cap's best friend. But we all knew from the outside, Tony, you're not. You're not Cap's best friend. Like, the first time you guys met, you almost punched each other. So, like, th- <laughs> those aren't best friends. Cap's best friend's the guy who saved him from a trash fight in an alleyway in Brooklyn. That's the best friend, Tony. So, um, this movie, again, so many good moments. And even though Infinity War was my number five, this, to me, Captain America Civil War, 
was the first time I felt like I was watching a Marvel Comics superhero crossover crossover event in live action. It was this one. Yeah. Like as many yeah. characters as they stuffed in this movie and seeing them all interact. And and that's the thing that I love about these superhero live action adaptations. It's the thing I love about all the Arrowverse crossovers. It's not the smackety smackdown. It's really just seeing the characters interact with each other. They can just have the characters talk to each other. Because, like, the moment where Ant-Man meets Captain America for the first time and he's flummoxed and he doesn't know what to do is you could you could have made a whole movie out of that that scene. The same with Peter Parker, you know, having to decide that, like, oh, I got to punch Captain America. This is weird. I don't know if I should do this. Um, And all the other Avengers realizing that Tony brought a child to a fight. Because he's calling all their favorite movies like The Empire Strikes Back old oldies. oldies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, Captain America Civil War for me is my number four and definitely deserves to be in the top five. Again, the first, I feel, superhero crossover event in live action. So, all right. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm going to jump in really quick and yeah. say this is my number two because oh. uh, for all the reasons that you mentioned, uh, with, with an extra emphasis on all those comic book covers and shots uh title page splash pages where you have the two sides of the two you know two groups of characters all facing at each other you'd never expect that to work in a in a in a movie but it completely and totally works it's, it is the the visual embodiment of all those comic book covers that we grew up seeing where you have the two different uh teams on either side of the front of the page uh staring at each other about to take each other out is so great yeah it's great i also forgot to mention um when I saw Captain America Civil War, it is the only movie I've ever been to where a title card elicited an audience wide applause and almost ovation <laughs> when Tony's like, oh, I got to get some more people. And it just cuts to the title card of Queens. Everybody in the theater exploded mm. because we all knew that that was Spider-Man. That's so, so great. I, and yeah. I, I, I feel that whenever they get to the point of introducing the Fantastic Four into this universe and mm-hmm. we see the title card Yancey Street or mm-hmm. Baxter Building. Baxter Building. It's right. gonna be the yeah. same thing. People are gonna be like, Wah! So uh again, Captain America Civil War. Uh, this is your number two, Brian? This is my number two. The other the other thing I wanted to bring up too was we you know we get a little bit of Scarlet Witch of course in uh in Avengers and Age of Ultron, all that but this is where you actually start to realize what a great character she is and you start to see her flaws and her feelings. I mean, it is, it is her, um, part in the battle that kind of causes the, uh, Sokovia act to be, to be brought forward, to be uh, enacted and her realization of that, her involvement of that, her reactions during the fights. It's just, it's great to see that character kind of get developed and, and I'm excited that she's, um, that we're going to see more of her, obviously, in future films. We're hoping we see more of her in future films. I, I, I think I think it's a safe bet, especially with that, so that TV too. show oh, yeah, that's coming down right, the road. The TV show, yeah. yes. All right, Ashley, what is your... We haven't said your number three, right? Mm, no. We're hopping all over the place, so I'm, like, I'm, I'm getting a little <laughs> that's lost. That's okay. What are numbers? Who's yes. time? What are Infinity Stones? All right, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, my number three is a movie that I'm going to acknowledge you can lob a pretty big criticism at for a specific casting choice. Oh, I'm ready. But I think is a really incredible movie. I really enjoyed it. It made me believe that 3D was worth going to see a movie in. It stars one of my all-time favorite Englishmen, uh, not being English, and that is Doctor Strange. Mm. Um Yes, the casting of Tilda Swinton as the Ancient One was not a good choice. I acknowledge that. I hear you. Um, I understand if for you that is a reason to not like or support that movie. I think that's fine. But I was really excited for Doctor Strange to be brought into the universe when his name was dropped out of nowhere. Um, Jason and I were like smacking each other on the leg in the theater. Winter Soldier. Yep, that was really exciting. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting to have magic properly introduced in the MCU as long as we've had an MCU because Thor did it and then undid it and I'm mad about that and I will die mad about that. (laughs) Um, And Doctor Strange really fully embraces it because they have to. And when they announced that if I can't have Benedict Cumberbatch as Reed Richards, I think having him as Stephen Strange is really cool. I like that this movie dares to be weird in the way it is shot, in what it 
uh, de- the concept it deals with, the way that it just leans into it. Like the sling ring is something that was completely invented for the movie, but I think really, really works. And then to see Doctor Strange in Infinity War, and, and Jason mentioned earlier, I bring this up because we watched it recently. He is one of the most powerful characters in this universe. He holds down that fight with Thanos on Titan. If they did not have him, um, they would have they would have had their butts handed to them a lot earlier. And he's going to be the reason that they ultimately defeat Thanos because he saw the one reality where it happened and set those events into motion. And um, people will also criticize the standalone Doctor Strange movie because they like to say that Steven doesn't go on a journey the way that we see some other characters go on a more full tilt journey. And I just think it's because we're dealing with smaller degrees of a character. I actually think Stephen Strange undergoes a pretty monumental shift over the course of that. He goes from being literally like when we talk about problematic white men, that is who Stephen Strange <laughs> starts this movie off as. He's the one percent. Yeah. yeah. And and over the course of this movie, he learns that, yes, the people that you care about are important. Yes, you can let your emotions lead your way and you don't need to have the fancy car, the fancy title. I mean, he still gets a fancy title out of it in a really dope mm-hmm. cloak, but he really genuinely appreciates all of the privilege and all the titles that he's given by the end. And he winds up making a lot of sacrifices for all the people around him. And then any excuse you can give me to have Benedict Wong on screen being sassy by doing the least, I am all here for it. Um, it's the one of the Marvel movies I return to the theaters most to see. And the first time it truly felt magic. So I had to put Doctor Strange on my list at number three. I want to hop in on this a little bit because yeah. <laughs> Doctor Strange did not make my list. But I'm it, surprised by that. But it's the one that felt the most painful to mm-hmm. not include. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to say this right now. The best score of all the Marvel movies because Michael Giacchino's score to Doctor Strange is an amazing score to listen to. I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tack this on too. If people want a top five MCU scores, uh, they could request it and we'd love to have Brian back for that. Oh, man. Ooh, <laughs> As our music fun. guy. I, I'd, yeah. I'd be into doing a top five superhero scores. Great. I think that would be a great list. I, I'm <laughs> so, I listen to so many scores when I write. Like this is like, I listen to the Doctor Strange one actually a lot. Um, but the interesting thing is I agree with you and this is the reason why um, I, d- I didn't include it on the list because, again, for me, what I, I realized for myself in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that I'm looking for those superhero crossovers and the big explosions. Mm-hmm. And, but Doctor Strange, yeah, I agree with you. He does go on an amazing character arc, more so than some of the other Marvel characters, which is why I enjoy that movie. I also think it is ballsy and, and very confident filmmaking to end your giant superhero movie with a simple shot of a man looking out a window as he looks at his hand shaking. Mm-hmm. And I think I was like, that is an interesting choice for a, you know, basically an action movie that that's where you leave us with this character. Because again, when we start the journey with Dr. Strange, that's what he wanted to fix. And as we find over the course of the movie, he doesn't fix his hands. But he, he fixes lear- his heart. He learns he doesn't have yeah. to. Do and, and that's why one of the greatest character moments, I think, also in the whole Marvel Universe is at the beginning of Infinity War, which we've already talked about a little bit on this list. Doctor Strange and Tony don't get along. And my character motivation for that is, is that I think that Steven looks at Tony and says and sees, oh, that's who I used to. Yes, be. yes, yes. Um, I also I also think that particularly with uh, the third phase, we're starting to get this is this is going to sound like I'm being crappy about the actors of the first or the second phase. I don't mean it to come off like that, but I think we get some really phenomenal, really powerhouse actors being cast in the third phase because uh, the MCU was a viable moneymaker by this point, so agents are throwing their actors at it. I like Chadwick Boseman. Uh, like, and I was going to say Black Panther mm-hmm. is another one where um, you know Benedict Cumberbatch does bring a really. Uh, I guess a Shakespearean performance. I'll say. A gravitas. Yeah, to uh, mm-hmm. to this character, which is why he works. Because uh, Doctor Strange in the beginning of this movie is a real butthole. <laughs> yes. But anyway, it's my number three movie, and I really like it. And it's okay if you don't. I'll just watch it more. It's a great choice. It's a great choice. Very good choice. All right, Brian, have we revealed your number three? We have not, and it's a great, uh, Doctor Strange is a great lead-in to my number three because nice. Doctor Strange appears uh, near the beginning of my number three film. It is a film that came out in 2017. It is Thor Ragnarok. Nice. 
Um, overall, one of the most fun Marvel movies, I think, uh, that they've released. Um, no small part to Taika Waititi, who directed it and even appears as um, one of my favorite characters, fan favorite character, Korg. Um, it is, uh, from start to finish, just a lot of fun. A lot of a lot of comedy elements interwoven within the story elements that that don't make you miss that uh, a majority of this film does not take place on Earth. The, the part that does take place on Earth features Doctor Strange and and working with um, Thor, a great interaction for those two characters meeting for the first time. Uh, hilarious interaction, you know, Thor scrambling stuff all over Doctor Strange's desk and drinking not tea and having beer instead. Um, it, is, it is from start to finish so much fun. And you would think that a character played by Jeff Goldblum would not work in a Marvel MCU film. I guess that's a little redundant, an MCU film. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it absolutely uh, works. He, he's great as the games master and is such a fun character. Oh, you've got sparkles. Are you, did, you, did you mean to make some sparkles? It was great. You know, that sort of thing. He's, he's such a great addition to the, the MCU. Kind of, again, you know, uh, hoping we see more of, of him later on. I guess he's the brother of... Um, Tavon, uh, the collector, is their their yeah Benicio del Toro, who possibly Benicio might be dead. Oh really? Oh right, right, right. Of course, with the stuff that happened in Infinity War. Jeez, I can't keep trying. I need a, I need a checklist on who's there. There are like five hundred and seventy eight <laughs> characters. In this I know universe. we like, we need really like a are, bingo yeah. card. Like, is this character dead? <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> well, one one character that we don't see in Infinity War, but has been uh, confirmed by the actress who plays her to still be alive, is uh, Valkyrie, played by Tessa Thompson, one of my favorite characters in this thing as well. Oh yeah, uh, she's again, a great addition to the universe. She really is, and I'll watch her in anything. Love her in Westworld. Can't wait to see her in the Men in Black films, and or the the Men in Black film that's coming up, and love her in this. And so I'm I'm really excited, hoping that we get some more Tessa Thompson in Endgame. But uh, overall, the color palette of this movie, the the music choices, come on. I mean, you've got uh, the Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin used with great effect in here. Um, I've even mentioned Kate Blanchett. Uh, again, what an amazing casting choice. You know, so many acclaimed actors who are now saying, oh, comic book movie? Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> you would never expect to see in comic book movies, uh, you know, if they if they would have gotten asked earlier in their uh, careers. So cool. Uh, Thor Ragnarok, my number three. One of the great things about Thor Ragnarok is that what a lot of people don't realize is that it ties into Thor 1 a lot more than you realize. A lot more even so than The Dark World did. And that's something that when I saw it in theaters, I didn't realize that. But when I watched it on Netflix about six months back, there are a lot of repeated lines and cutlets of uh, of lines that actors say in Thor 1 that other characters repeat in Thor Ragnarok. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. it's like Taika Waititi like, like snuck a lot of them in there, and I didn't catch that the first time because I was just laughing, you know, my ass off. But the yeah. second time, I was like, oh, this one really ties into Thor 1 a lot more than you realize. And, and because of that, when you see this idea that the movie is, this is Thor realizing that he needs to be king because he couldn't see it being in Asgard. Like, he needed Mm-hmm. All of Asgard taken away from him and basically his entire support structure taken away from him to realize like, oh, no, he is worthy to be king and he should be king. And that once you p- apply that on top of Thor Ragnarok, it's very interesting. It makes his like coronation at the very end of Thor Ragnarok actually like a lot more impactful. Way more important in arc. Wow. OK, yeah. cool. I'll have to pay attention to that the next time I watch. Yeah, yeah go wa- watch Thor one and then immediately watch Thor Ragnarok and you'll see it. Okay. So there you go. All right. My number three, of course, was Black Panther. So actually, we are up to your number two. Hey, Brian gave a great uh, lead up to my number two. (laughs) Um, My number two is um, a movie that I think is pretty divisive, actually, among MCU fans. But I thought it was going to be terrible when I saw it and then was very unterrible. Uh, And that is the first Thor movie. I love it so much because it is directed by Kenneth Branagh and sort of like I was talking about in Doctor Strange, I think it feels Shakespearean and grand and theatrical in the sense of live theater in a way that none of the other MCU movies, including subsequent Thor movies, do. And for a story set on Asgard, I really love that quality about it. I 
I really like the humor and the evolution to Thor Ragnarok, but I could go a little. I could go a little more back to like Loki screaming, "Tell me!" at the top of his lungs, uh, even though I think Loki's dead for real, for real, for real, for real. And I think Thor is one of the first Phase One movies that understands that you can really be a character piece, and that can be the strength of where your story comes from because Thor lives and dies on the performances of Thor. And Loki, and I like Chris Hemsworth, but he's no Tom Hiddleston. And Tom Hiddleston really elevates uh, this character who could have just been, honestly, in the grand tradition of the MCU, a a one-off that we never saw again. I think they were poising and hoping that Loki would be a little bit bigger because Loki is the original Avengers villain from Avengers 1. They fight Loki. Um, Also, Hulk fights a train, right? Or a circus? Uh, in, in Avengers issue one, he fights a circus. There you go. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> oh, but he also attacks a train. He does both. Yeah, can't wait to see that in uh, Endgame. It's going to be dope. Um, <laughs> but they're really lucky um, that Tom Hiddleston had done Wallander with Kenneth Branagh like two years before. And so he ported him over into this movie. Uh, this movie was the first Marvel movie that really surprised me. It was the first that gave me an inkling of what this universe could be. And every time I return to it, uh, even amidst the flaws, I really love it. And if you look at it, and you look particularly at Thor on Earth, they lay down the groundwork for Ragnarok and for that type of humor with the way he behaves in the human realm. And again, I loved that we were doing magic and that the dark world had to say, no, this is science and I don't want it to be science. I want it to be gods and magic. Uh, For me, Thor was the first truly magical MCU movie. And it means a lot to me. Every time I watch it, I still love it. So I put it at my number two. Uh, don't tweet me. <laughs> we got to point out the great thing about Thor, Kenneth Branagh and all the Dutch angles on Earth. Yes, so it's that's their unreality. Yeah, so so for Thor, Earth is the weird place. So it's off kilter. Every shot on right. Earth is off kilter. Every shot on Asgard is is horizontal and normal, which I thought was really? a genius is a genius directing oh, that's choice. Brilliant! Yeah, yeah. Wow. Huh. Yeah, Thor Thor <laughs> at its I think at face value is like it's a fun superhero movie yeah. and then the more you look at it you're like, oh this is actually really well thought out and really well plotted and really smart. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I, I like the first Thor movie. I think Me it's really good. Too. Mm-hmm. Also, I think your first look at the Infinity Gauntlet, that's not canonically the same Infinity Gauntlet. Well, <laughs> also, yeah, right. Thor it's 1. It's a replica. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's full of Easter eggs. Thor 1 also yeah. has the Eye of Agamotto. That's true, yeah, yeah. In, in it, the oh, treasure right. room. Yeah, it's in the treasure room that they completely just ignore. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You just have to assume that uh, maybe Odin saw them once and thought they was pretty, and yeah. so, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Sith- He's got a killer 3D printer that yeah. they can make in a control. <laughs> Turn out uh, artifacts. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> I also will say that Thor 1 has one of my favorite Stan Lee cameos with him being the trucker trying to pull out the, with the JMS, hammer. With JMS, yeah. With, with J. Michael Straczynski, another Thor writer. Yeah. yeah. Which I think was I just think Stan Lee as a trucker is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Brian, what is your number two? Well, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but uh, it is Captain America Civil War. Uh, again, that... Um, uh, seeing that comic book battle or those those comic book battles that I grew up with being brought uh, brought to life is just amazing. And um, some of my favorite issues of uh, of comic books were the team up issues. It's where, you know, you've got Spider-Man and so and so joining in with them. And um, and so getting to see this kind of team up thing with with half of the Avengers on one side, half of the Avengers on the other side, brand new Black Panther, brand new Spider-Man. um, other characters kind of coming into their own, like I mentioned, uh, uh, Wanda and and um, uh, and and uh, Rhodes. Oh man, War Machine getting you know one of the most shocking and heartbreaking scenes, and then kind of uh, coming out of it seemingly okay on the other side. Uh, and, it, and again, another great Stan Stanley appearance with Tony Stank delivering a, uh, you know delivering a package. So to Tony. good, <laughs> so funny, and. Um, uh, when you go back and you look at all of the different um, sections, the different acts of Captain America: Civil War, and you've got the um, the battle uh, in um, in Wakanda, you've got the uh, the stuff going on at the airport, you've got the stuff going on at the bunker. It's it feels like so many different movies, and it feels like 
you, it could easily have been just called Avengers Civil War. But the fact that it's a Captain America movie, we've got that relationship with him and Winter Soldier is, is, uh, that gets further developed uh, is just great. So, yeah, my number two got mentioned earlier, but I'm mentioning it again is Captain America Civil War. Always a great choice. That's why I put it on my list as my mm-hmm. number four. Yep. All right. My number two is going all the way to number one. And by that, I mean, I'm talking about the first Marvel movie of all time. Iron Man is my number two. The reason behind this is because I think the first Iron Man movie was it crossed the hurdle that many people didn't think it was. I remember back in 2007 when they showed the first trailer for Iron Man at Comic-Con. And the reason why I was so excited is because I was an Iron Man fan back in the day. But I remember when they released that trailer publicly, most people were like, all right. Because Iron Man was a C-list character in the Marvel Universe, and a lot of people didn't like Iron Man. And so I remember the criticism being, why are you starting with Iron Man? That is the worst (laughs) choice to start with Iron Man. (laughs) And a lot of people at that time, Robert Downey Jr. was coming off a lot of problems in his life. Had not been in a good film in quite a while. Didn't he have to pay his own insurance to be on set? He did. <laughs> did he? he did because Paramount at the time Paramount was releasing the for, Paramount released the first four Marvel films uh, before they got bought up by Disney. Paramount required Robert Downey Jr. to buy his own insurance, which I I want to say I heard one figure was something like forty million dollars because he was just such an unbelievable risk to be in this movie, but. He was such a great risk that he worked. John Favreau creates this electric energy in this movie. And this movie, to me, still holds up as one of the best Marvel movies. Now, there are a couple points where the Iron Man suit looks kind of rubbery and looks like some PS4 graphics. But for the most of the movie, it looks great because this is one of the only Iron Man movies where they actually built a practical suit. And it's a big problem that I have with some of the Marvel, the current Marvel movies is that they just have them do mocap suits and it looks like there's a head just floating through the background because they're definitely not in that suit. But in this movie, they were practical Iron Man suits and they look great and they still hold up to this day. But the dialogue in this movie is something that I have to specifically point out because a lot of things people don't know about this movie is that this movie was filmed with no script. Oh, really? This movie only had an outline. And that makes me so bad at such irresponsible filmmaking. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so, what they, when this movie went to start a production, they had basically a pretty detailed outline. I want to say the outline was like 40 pages long, where it kind of basically described what was going to happen in each of the scenes, but they hadn't written the dialogue. And Paramount set a hard date for them. They were like, you're coming out May of next year, and so you better get filming. And at the time, Jon Favreau only had so much time, and he was like, okay, I can either right now work on getting the suit to look as amazing as it can, or... I can write the script. And he chose making the suit look as amazing as it can. And so he introduced all the actors. Hey, let's rehearse these scenes. Let's just let these scenes go where they go. This is where the scene begins. This is where the scene, the climax of the scene is. This is where the end of the scene is. Let's just see what happens. So a lot of lines in the movie are Robert Downey improvs. Like the line of going to Burger King. That is a Robert Downey improv. But that line is so rememberable. You're like, oh my God, I remember that line. And fun fact, um, Jeff, uh, what's his name? Help me out. Uh, Jeff Brolin, a Brolin. Uh, uh, Bridges? Uh, uh, Bridges? I was, all I could think was Daniels, and I knew that was the wrong yeah. one. Well, the other Jeff Brolin that's Brolin is Thanos, of course. Josh Brolin. Josh Brolin, excuse me. Uh, good <laughs> Lord. Uh, so many Jeffs. Uh, <laughs> Jeffs and Josh's. Uh, he actually, Jeff Bridges, quit the movie on day three because he didn't like the improv of it. He was like, I want a script, and they had to convince him to come back. But that's another idea of like the fact that they shot this movie with no script, and the movie is actually great. Is amazing, but also to me, you can feel that there's this energy in this movie that some of the other Marvel movies don't have, and that's the reason why for me, like every time I watch Iron Man one, I enjoy the hell out of it, and I and I understand why this movie blew up. The other interesting thing you have to realize is that Iron Man one came out the same year as The Dark Knight, 
And the fact that both these movies came out in the same year and that neither one of them buried the other one is kind of interesting. It just goes to show you how strong these movies are. Um, Iron Man 1 is my number two. And uh, it's great. Go back and watch it. Such a great choice. It, and our, our first Phil Coulson, too. Our first uh, Clark Gregg. Our he's first, actually just uh, agent in that movie. He doesn't that's even give, right. He's not even given a name. That's right. Uh, our first uh, Nick Fury. Uh, yeah, so much great stuff. And oh, they, yeah. You got to you, they that is something else to, to imagine. The first end credit scene with Nick Fury saying the Avengers initiative. Right. That is right. something that is beyond amazing to put into that movie. For so. sure. All right. Now, before we get to all of our number ones, we have to thank our sponsor for today's episode. Uh, and that is Wix which I am certain that is used, they're used by the Avengers. Uh, Wix is a site where you can start and publish your website for free. You can choose over 500 stunning templates and start from scratch, and you can change and customize and add anything you want, like text, images, videos, more. There's hundreds of design features. Then grow your brand online. Guys, we use Wix for our websites because it's really easy. It's really easy to put menus on there. It's really easy to put lists on there. It's really easy to put buttons and clip art. The Dancing Spider-Man, we've talked about that on several podcasts, you know, the little Dancing Spider-Man gift that was all over Geocities a long, long time ago. Yeah, Wix lets you do that. So you can get started now by going to Wix.com. That's W-I-X dot com slash podcast and get 10% off your very easy website. It is so easy to use. Wix.com slash podcast. Thanks to Wix for sponsoring the podcast. And now we are here. The number ones. <laughs> the part where we are going to judge every one of our choices. On what we pick is the number one. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Ashley, what's your number one choice for the best Marvel Cinematic Universe film? Um, well, I think I've said this about 150,000 times on this podcast, so I'm sure it won't be um, a surprise to any listener. The best Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, in my opinion, is Captain America Winter Soldier. The Winter Soldier, Ashley. Don't forget the the. Look, if you're <laughs> tweeting that at me, I've probably already muted you. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> um, the really simple fangirl answer is because Bucky. Because he's the best. He's one of my favorite characters. He was before the movies. Um, he was after they cast a little Romanian boy to play him because they wanted him to play Captain America. But Marvel said, no, Captain America has to be played by an American. So that's fine. Who was the Romanian? Sebastian Stan. Oh, re- oh, it's he was born I did not in Romania. He was I, Romanian. I, wow. Yeah. I knew he wasn't born in America. He's like it? off the boat Romanian. Ah. And as someone who was also off the boat, I could say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, but uh, you know, he's been like working since he was like twelve. Like he's been in America most of his life. But he is Romanian. Um, I suspect his first name might be spelled a little differently than we all think it is spelled. But that's only my conspiracy theory. Um, <laughs> what I really think is special when I take it out of the fangirl scope about Winter Soldier is it's the first first real departure from the style, the house style of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And there was nothing wrong with that house style. A lot of movies have returned to it. It's what built the house, the foundation. Iron Man 1, yeah. Yeah, that that this movie stands on. But um, this was the first time that we did anything different. This is a spy movie. This is a 1970s intrigue story plot. Uh, which I think is helped along by uh, who they cast as the villain. I think that probably also helps in why they stylize it this way. But it's what makes this movie feel so unique. It's why this movie works as a Captain America story. And you're not watching this thinking, shouldn't they call the Avengers the way you are in like Iron Man 3 or some other or, or even Thor? That Thor 2, world. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Where you're like, the whole world is being threatened. You have an entire team. Why don't you get over your ego and call your entire team? This makes sense to be a story where Cap is taking the lead and it's a Cap and Black Widow story. In my opinion, this is one of the only movies where Black Widow is palatable. I even think she's really quite good in this movie. And I'm sad when I see her do other things in other movies that don't live up to what is being thrown down here. Her wig also looks pretty good in this movie, and I'm sad every time they don't wear this wig. It introduces not only Winter Soldier, and and yes, Bucky was introduced in the first Avenger, but... It's not the same character. This is basically a new introduction to who this character is. The moment where he says, who the hell is Bucky, breaks my heart every time. The fight at the end breaks my heart. And I really didn't think that I needed a live-action Falcon. 
But he's so great here. Even though Anthony Mackie is so big, he doesn't know what to do with his arms. And you could definitely tell in some of the mediums. He's really wonderful here. And this sets the standard for his relationship with Bucky that actually gets to be really comedic and really engaging in Civil War and in and, some later it's movies. It's going to lead to their TV show. Yes, it is. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's all because of this movie. Every time I think about what Marvel movie could I watch, this comes to the forefront. And I think it's because it's about... A little boy from Brooklyn and his best friend. And now he gets the chance to try to save him. And what does that story look like? Yeah, the action pieces are great. Everything else I talked about is really great. But it wears its heart on its sleeve. And that's why I respond to it so much. Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Even though the Winter Soldier is in about 12 minutes of it. (laughs) And says exactly five lines. It's my favorite Marvel movie. Hands down. No question. Good choice. I'm going to hop in here (laughs) because my number one is also Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Heck yeah. (laughs) Um, For all the reasons you chose, Ashley, uh, I I agree. Like to me, this is the best Marvel Cinematic film because it's the first one that makes it a film. You're right. It's the first one that pushes it past just a normal superhero movie. There are so many elements of this movie, especially even the themes of the aggressive patriotism against the anti-government paranoia kind of stuff. And and this film is like more inspired by all the president's men than it is Iron Man 1. Mm-hmm. And you're right. Like They found this emotional core to take with Captain America, which is very interesting. The idea that Everything he does is about loyalty. And this is also the film to me that ensures that Captain America has the best trilogy of the entire MCU. Like he has all three of his movies. I love I love them all. And when you watch them in succession, even though the third movie, Captain America movie is Avengers Smackdown. It still carries through the I'm with you till the end of the line. Like it, it under you understand that why Cap makes these choices. And, and it's also. Winter Soldier to me is why Cap becomes the most compelling character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Also, I think Winter Soldier is the reason why all stories based on Captain America are going to be based on Chris Evans' performance from here on out. Because Winter Soldier, I feel, is almost a Superman the movie level movie. Like, it so encapsulates Everything that is a Captain America, everything that bleeds Captain America, that people are going to use this as the template going forward. And we didn't even mention at this point, Robert Redford is the villain of this movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the fact that you got Robert Redford to come into a superhero movie <laughs> and, and not not even that, the fact that Robert Redford was in all the president's men is like even doubly down on this. But this movie Every scene, every action scene is not just about punching the bad guy. Like, there is a reason. Even the fact of looking at this elevator scene, which is one of the most iconic action scenes in all of Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, it's about a bunch of guys that attack Cap. But when you put it in the subtext of the movie, it is about all these people, the government, telling Cap, this is the way you should act. And he has to fight like hell to break out of it, which he literally does. And every scene in this movie is layered with that subtext. That is why, yeah, for me, like when I thought about number one, there was no choice but Captain America, the Winter Soldier. So, all right, Brian, we got two mm. votes for Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Uh, <laughs> well, what is your number right. one? My number one, so it's kind of funny. Uh, your two number ones were almost on my list. Uh, almost had Winter Soldier on my list. I really, really enjoy that one, and and um, it was really close to making my top five. But in in kind of uh, the opposite parallels here, uh, your two number fives turn out to be num- my number one. And here's a number <laughs> one, like you know, the rest of our lists all nicely cemented. I mean, we're not going to change our opinions on how we feel about the rest of those movies. No, and nobody's list one, is right or wrong. Well, right. But but here's the thing. I mean, you know, we all feel really good about about our number, uh, our number one through five or your uh, number one through five, my number two through five. My number one hinges on how good (laughs) they stick the landing (laughs) uh, in the movie I'm going to see in about four days. And uh, so Infinity War, again, no surprise, is my number one. That opinion could change if they don't 
stick the landing if the ending doesn't live up to what they've set up. Um, so it's kind of funny. My, my whole list could change in five days. We don't know. But uh, I, don't, I don't feel like it is. I love Infinity War. I love everything that it sets up. And I talked about uh, with my what uh, my talked about Civil War, seeing these characters together, seeing all the individual movies, you know, seeing Iron Man, and then you get Black uh, Black Widow in there with Iron Man, and there's that interplay there, and you get, you know, uh, uh, Tony Stark and uh, Spider Man together in Homecoming, and that interaction, and and even more of that in Civil War, um, seeing all these characters almost thrown into a deck of cards, shuffled and then redistributed around. I mean, you get. Uh, Thor and Rocket, who I think are, I want to see a buddy cop movie with Thor and Rocket. Uh, just the way that those two interact. I want to see uh, more of Cap, Bucky, and Black Panther together um, in some of these little, you know, these little spin-off stories that they've got in Infinity War. It's so well done. And these, these interactions, and we haven't even talked about the Black Order and what a great um, uh, set of henchmen uh, they created for Thanos. So they created in the comics, but then brought to life in the, uh, uh, in the film. Uh, you know, a couple of them get taken out a little bit earlier than we would have liked. I want to see more of them, but, uh, but still a great set of, uh, thugs and henchmen for, uh, for Thanos's character. Um, Iron Man, Dr. Strange, Spider-Man, you know, out in space, uh, kind of looking forward to seeing how that gets wrapped up, but still it's such a great setup. And for a film that, that ends with so much, um, I don't know. It's it's that 11 year old me at the end of the Empire Strikes Back saying, "What? We we don't get to find out what happens to Han Solo." It was, it was I had that PTSD from uh, from that when I saw Infinity War coming back and saying, "Oh my God, we're not going to find out what happens to any of these characters until next year." The fact that that's only you know a few days away for me uh, as we record this is just such such a uh, level of excitement that again, makes me excited to see Infinity War again before I go see Endgame and uh, still still elevates it to the top of my list. I think that's all solid choices, man. It's, it's, it's hard not to, when you're just looking at the sheer audacity of that yeah. movie, to not just make it number one. And you are correct. We, we don't know. At the, again, the time of this recording, none of us have seen Avengers Endgame, even though we're going to be releasing this episode a couple weeks after everybody has seen Endgame. So everybody might be screaming at us to... <laughs> Avengers Endgame, of course, is number one. But you know what? We're judging this before Endgame because, you know, I almost feel like you have to. We we have a year on Infinity War, so we can objectively right. look at Infinity. Like the the sheer excitement of immediately seeing it has gone away, and that's probably going to permeate Endgame for quite a while. I imagine if they stick the landing, it's going to be hard to if if they do if they stick the landing, it's going to be hard to separate Infinity War and Endgame in future lists, right? Because mm-hmm. you're you're not going to be able to say, oh yeah, I liked one but not the other if they do really well as a as a pair, which they're written. It feels like they're written to be a pair. There's no way that Endgame yeah. goes off in any other direction than than uh, taking all these loose ends that we had from Infinity War, tying them up, and then setting the stage for the next phase of the Marvel Universe. Well, speaking of loose ends, everybody, I hope you all enjoyed our lists. And if you did, don't forget that we're going to be talking with Brian a little bit more on our Patreon. If you're a Patreon member over at patreon.com slash Jawin, that's J-A-W-I-I-N, we're going to be talking about Brian about some of his favorite Marvel comics from the past, some movies that maybe didn't make the list, all kinds of Marvel comic goodness with Brian on our episode of Geek History Lesson Extra, which you can only find over at patreon.com slash Jawin. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Brian. If uh, people want to find you online, they want to listen to your podcast, where should they go? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm pretty much called Coverville everywhere you go. So if you go to Twitter, you go to Twitter, I'm Coverville. If you go to the website, you have Coverville.com. That's where it's a good place to start to find out all the stuff I'm doing. Um, if you, uh, you know, you're okay about music, but you don't necessarily like music as much as you like, I don't know, a couple of guys rambling uh, every morning, then go to frogpants.com TMS and listen to the morning stream. It's a, uh, a comedy news and variety podcast put together by me and scott johnson and uh if you want to hear about that, brian jumping off the stratosphere that's the place to listen <laughs> that's right yeah, so, yeah that's that's gonna happen uh, a couple hours after endgame so i don't know what the most exciting part of my friday is gonna be 
<laughs> and um, then, uh, yeah, awesome. there's a reality show podcast out there, America's Next Top Podcaster, where uh, we, we started with 12 contestants. We whittled it down to one. And it's up to you listening to the entire series to find out how we got there and who ended up uh, taking the top prize there. But um, yeah, a lot of, lot of podcasts out there. It's like Lay's Potato Chips. You can't just do one. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone out there please go check out brian moore he's an amazing fella and uh we'll find out very soon whether he dies uh from a jump in las <laughs> yes, vegas <that's> right. yes. <laughs> these things become collector's items these yeah. shows at the time uh, of this recording this might be your last recording we don't know <laughs> oh my god no kidding <laughs> all right everybody thank you so much for listening don't forget to subscribe and listen to this podcast everywhere you find podcasts in your ear holes that's apple Podcasts, spotify soundcloud all those places and ashley if they want to subscribe Subscribe uh, and excuse me. If they want to suggest future lists like this one, like top five MCU scores or top five superhero scores, where could they do that? Yes, they can do that all kinds of places, including geekhistorylesson.com, facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson, or on Twitter at GHL Podcast. There's a whole bunch of ways to contact us in all of those places. Please tag the official accounts uh, in addition to or instead of our personal accounts, because that's how we track them. All right, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, and follow Ashley on Twitter at Ashley V. Robinson. And real quick, last section of this podcast, hashtag stick around. That's where we have one last discussion just to see if you listen to all our plugs. Brian, I'm going to ask you a rapid-fire question. <laughs> okay. And I want an immediate answer. Don't think. Just right. say whatever comes to your head immediately. Okay, here we go. Okay. Brian, what is the worst MCU movie? <laughs> uh thor dark world sorry uh, that's my answer too <laughs> yeah ashley yeah um i say ant-man <laughs> <laughs> all right there you go i don't have anything else than that thank you <laughs> thank you again to brian ibbett for joining us uh you have been listening to geek history lesson i have been jason marvelous inman i've been ashley victoria robinson and professor ashley will you please close out the podcast class is now dismissed <laughs>